education serves as a human right, a part of our humanity. Every person, every child deserves a right to humanity. What happens when someone else, or another group for that matter, refuses to acknowledge our humanity? On April 15, 2014, 300 girls' humanity was ignored when they were stolen from their school in Nigeria. The kidnapping of these young women made international news and sparked the start of a social media ca campaign, hashtag bring back our girls. Our girls. As global citizens, we saw this tragic event as one that impacts our world, not just Nigeria. And it continues to impact the humanity within all of us until these women are returned home. Our next speaker, Joseph Sabarenzi, just 1,700 miles away from Nigeria, understands firsthand what it's like to be robbed of humanity and to have your family robbed of humanity and have your community robbed of their humanity. But his story is one of empowerment and forgiveness and will definitely inspire the humanity with all of us. So please help me welcome to the springboard stage, Joseph Sabarenzi. Thank you very much for your warm welcome. Uh, so as uh, Raphael said, my name is Joseph Severenzi. I'm from Rwanda. Uh, he served as the president of the Rwandan parliament from 1997 to 2000. And I currently teach courses on human rights and conflict transformation at SIT Graduate Institute in Washington, DC. I'm very happy to be here and I want to share with you uh, my experiences of loss, extraordinary loss in the genocide in Rwanda, and my effort to overcome the trauma from that loss through forgiveness and reconciliation. And my hope is that you can learn from my experience and therefore increase your abilities in forgiveness and reconciliation so that you can be able to deal with your past sufferings but also be able to deal with your future sufferings because as you know, there are bad things and good things uh, in life. So, first I, uh, I want you to imagine a beautiful country. A beautiful country of many lakes, many hills, and many valleys. A country where the weather is never too hot and never too cold. A country where people have no idea what humidity is. A country where people have never seen snow. That country is the African nation of Rwanda, my country. So Rwanda is uh, uh, located in Central Africa. It has three ethnic groups, Hutu, Tutsi, and Twa. The three groups, unlike other groups in Africa, the three groups speak the same language. They practice the same religious beliefs. And they live side by side. We don't have a region for Hutu, a region for Tutsi. We live side by side. And because of that, I don't think we should even use the word ethnic. Because in anthropology, you can't use ethnic when people share the same language, same religious beliefs, and live side by side. So anyway, before I continue, I want to test how much you know about Rwanda. You already know something. But I want to test if you know more. And the question here uh, will come very soon on the screen, and the person who will get the answer right will get a copy of my book, which is God Sleeps in Rwanda, A Journey of Transformation. And that copy, that is there. So if you get the answer right, you get a copy of that book. So let's put those questions on the screen. So the question will be about, uh, about Rwanda, how much you know about Rwanda, and 
Okay, you see there, which of the following assertion about Rwanda is correct? Rwanda is the smallest African country. Rwanda is the most densely populated African country. And Rwanda is one of the three countries in the world where mountain gorillas still exist. Or all the above are correct. So now you're going to make the pollings. So choose your right answer. Okay, the answers will come in a few minutes. Just wait. I'll see who gets, who gets a copy of my book. Okay, are there. Okay, 64. That's all the above. Oh my God, that's the right answer. <laughs> <laughs> So who is going to get to the copy of my book? I should have brought many books. <laughs> so, anyway. so we find a way to, to get to a copy. OK, I don't know. OK. So Rwanda's ethnic groups, these three ethnic groups live together. They had lived together in peace. I mean, they lived together in peace for many years, for centuries, from time immemorial until the colonial power, Belgium, divided the two major ethnic groups, the Hutu and the Tutsi. So Belgians divided the Hutu and Tutsi in terms of uh, education and in terms of, uh, of jobs. So they did that for about four decades. And when they did, eventually, they decided, Belgium decided to shift their support, their favors, from Tutsi to Hutu. And when they did, when they shift, they made that shift during this movement of independence in Africa. And when independence was uh, granted to Rwanda, a Hutu-dominated political party took over and governed Rwanda for, for many years. So in that process of power shift from Hutu to Tutsi, and under the leadership of that Hutu dominated the political party, many, many Tutsi were killed. In fact, from 1959 to 1967, about 20,000 Tutsi were killed, and about 300,000 were driven out of Rwanda to neighboring uh, countries. Eventually, the Tutsi who were in the exile decided to organize so they can go back to Rwanda. They organized, and in 1990, they attacked Rwanda. When they did, I was in Rwanda that time. I remember I was arrested, put in jail, because the government thought that I was, behind, I was in touch with these rebels, which was not true. So this attack. Uh, lasted, I mean this war, because it became a war, it lasted basically about four years. And the genocide, which took place in 1994, actually took place within a context of a war, a war between uh, that Tutsi-dominated rebel movement and Hutu-dominated government forces. And as you know, of course, in the genocide, about uh, Eight, 500 uh, and 800,000 were killed, and they were killed basically within three months. You can imagine between 500,000 and 800,000 killed within three months only. And they were killed by Hutu extremists. These Hutu extremists not only killed Tutsi, but also killed their fellow Hutu who were known to oppose the genocide, and those who attempted to protect their Tutsi, uh, their Tutsi neighbors. So now, I want you to imagine someone who lost so many people in that tragedy. Someone for whom this tragedy, the genocide, is very personal. You don't have to look very far. Uh, I am here. My father was killed. My mother was killed. And my seven brothers and sisters were killed in that genocide. It was a tragedy uh, to me. 
and it was a tragedy to so many people uh, in Rwanda. And let me uh, share with you one of the pictures I was able to recover after the genocide. On the picture uh, that I'm going to show, it's a picture, uh, it's a picture of my uh, extended family. It's one of the pictures I was able to recover. And, and this was a wedding, wedding of my, uh, my older brother here, Samuel. So on this picture, you can see my father, he was killed. My mother was killed. My stepmother was killed. My sister was killed. Basically, almost everyone on this picture was killed, including my older brother who was having a wedding, his wife, and their three uh, children. So this was really a catastrophe. It's very difficult to describe uh, this. And I'm sure I would have been killed if I, were in, if I were in Rwanda during the genocide. Before the genocide, my wife, my son, and me, we fled to the neighboring country of Burundi. Then after the genocide, we decided to go back to Rwanda because we felt safe. We felt safe because the government that was behind the genocide was overthrown. It was overthrown by the, the Tutsi-dominated rebel force. So we felt safe, we went back to Rwanda. But once in Rwanda, I was really shocked. It was no longer the country that I knew. It was a completely different country. Not only uh, my parents were killed, my seven brothers and sisters were killed, but also our house was completely destroyed. My Tutsi friends, most of them were killed. My Hutu friend had fled Rwanda for fear of being killed by the new regime. So it was, very, uh, it was very difficult. And you could see people in the street without a leg or people who had lost an arm. It was difficult. And I could see in the eyes of genocide survivors, I mean, the trauma. I could see the fear in the eyes of, of, of Hutu who were afraid or who had lost a, a loved one. So it was very difficult. But of course, I myself had my own uh, my own trauma, uh, and it was very painful. Uh, I was devastated, as you can imagine. Uh, I would spend many hours a day uh, wondering why our neighbors killed my loved ones. I would spend many hours at night with no sleep. Headaches, uh, stomachache had basically become part of my daily uh, life. But as you can imagine, I had to survive. I had to find ways to survive. And I had to make a living. And so I, I found a job. And one of my jobs was to, uh, to help assess uh, the possibility of using a traditional court system to bring to justice genocide suspect. And so I had to travel across Rwanda visit prisons and talk to people. And one day, uh, I visited one prison in Kigali, in the capital of Kigali. And I, as I was walking through a crowd of prisoners, I heard someone calling out my name. That person happened to be the former mayor of my home district. This man used to be a friend uh, of my uh, of my family. And this man was there because he was suspected of involvement in the, uh, in the genocide. So I looked at this man. He had lost weight. He was suffering because of prison conditions, which were very harsh, were very uh, miserable. So I talked to this man, and I asked him whether he was involved in the genocide. He said no, but I didn't believe him because I had learned that he was behind. He encouraged Hutu in my home district to kill Tutsi who were there, including uh, my family. So when I heard him saying that he was not involved in genocide, I knew I felt he was lying. But I wasn't really struck by his lies. I was struck by his suffering. This is a man who was suffering, and I could see that 
he needed help. So now, the question I'm going to ask you is to put yourself in my shoes and tell me what do you think I should have done to this man who happened to be a genocide suspect, but who was suffering and who needed help? Let's put those questions uh, on the screen. Okay, there they are. So, what do you think I should have done to the former mayor under these circumstances? Be mad at him and tell him how evil he was? Ignore him and walk away? Or help him if I was able to? Choose one. Okay, we have, uh, we have this. So we have 47, oh, more. Okay, it's changing, keep changing. So let's wait one, maybe a few seconds, one minute to see what happens. You know, it is, it's a tough question. It's a tough question. You are in front of this man. The man did evil, but he needs help. So what do you do? It's a tough question. I think everyone has voted now, and we can see that 44 point, no, it keeps changing. <laughs> it's very tough. You keep changing your answers. Well, let's just make a comment about this. 44.1% think, help this man. Oh my God, you are, I see how compassionate you are. You know, when I looked at this man and see how miserable he was, somehow the anger I had, the bitterness that I had, somehow disappeared. And another emotion slowly rose to the surface. And that was compassion. That was a compassion, not anger, not bitterness but compassion. So despite what this man had done, I felt sorry for him. And I reached into my pocket and I pulled some money and gave to him to buy food. After I did, of course, I left. While outside, one woman I was with, an American woman who was in Rwanda helping with that research, she said, so you don't believe this man was involved in the genocide? I said, no, I believe. But at that particular moment, when I looked at this man, I looked at him as a human being in need, as a human being who was suffering, and they happened to have money. So somehow I forgot what I had gone through, and I decided to extend kindness to him. This mayor, when I did, really, I remember when I did, he could not believe. I don't think he could have... Imagine a genocide survivor showing kindness to him. And when I, sh I gave that money, I remember, I could see him smiling, s having some joy. And at the same time, actually, I also felt some joy. Which means, basically, when you extend kindness to someone, you are, in fact, extending kindness to, to yourself. So this is something we, uh, we should really uh, we should know. So, after that episode, of course, as you can imagine, um, in Rwanda, doing all that, I was still struggling with my anger, with my bitterness, but that gesture of helping this man was a part of my journey toward forgiveness and reconciliation. It was uh, a result of a decision I had made to find a way to cope with this loss. So now, the question, the, the last question I'm going to ask you is, let's suppose you have decided to show kindness or to engage on forgiveness and reconciliation despite everything that happened. You have made that decision. So what is going to keep you dedicated 
on that process of forgiveness and reconciliation. If you could choose just one, which one will motivate you the most to remain on that process of forgiveness and reconciliation? Let's see what you choose. Okay, your responses will come in a few minutes. Okay, so um, mm, keep coming. So, desire for peace is it uh, your religious faith? Is it uh, your awareness that your awareness that uh, these emotion, anger, and uh, bitterness uh, can harm your health? Well, um, I can see that uh, forty-nine percent are motivated by the desire for peace. Well, uh, these motivations, these three motivations, desire for peace, your faith, and awareness that anger and bitterness harm you are all valid. They are all valid. Together, they really helped me to make a sense of forgiveness and reconciliation. They helped me to understand that forgiveness and reconciliation are in our best interests, individually and collectively. And I'm going to explain each of these. One is the first one that you chose, most of you chose, uh, peace for future generations. Here is how I came up uh, with this. I reasoned that my parents and my brothers and sisters were gone. There was nothing I could do to bring them back. But I had my son, my wife, and many young people, like some of you, and you could look in their eyes and see how innocent they were. So I felt well, there is nothing I can do for those dead, but I can do something to help future generation to live in peace. You know, I looked at the way uh, how this, this cycle of violence in Rwanda went from one generation to another and to the next, and I said it should stop. I looked at how this cycle of violence went from my mother, and from my grandmother, to my mother, to myself, and I felt it should not reach my children. And I felt it was a matter of compassion to future generation because I understood when you take revenge, Basically, you are perpetuating that cycle of, of hatred, of evil. But when you restrain using forgiveness, you are giving a chance to future generations to live in peace. And I think Martin Luther King said it very well when he said that returning hate for hate multiplies violence, making darker a night already devoid of stars. So it really makes sense. And the, I understood that forgiveness and reconciliation helps to promote peace for future generations. So it became really a great motivation to me. But that was not it. In addition to peace for future generations, I also embraced, I also embraced, I mean, I embraced forgiveness and reconciliation because of my faith. And I know you all have your own faith. But my Christian faith, like all faith, teaches forgiveness, not revenge. Teach reconciliation, not retaliation. So I felt that if I were honest, I had to live by those values. I had to live by those values that we are all taught in Islam, in Hinduism, in Buddhism, in Judaism, we are taught to forgive. We are taught to reconcile. So I felt I had to be honest with myself. And I remembered some of biblical verses that I learned when I was very young. And one of them was basically about saying, he says that, he um, said this way, he says, not to take revenge, not to be overcome by evil, but to overcome evil with good. 
And I also remembered one story I enjoyed when I was very young, a story about a conversation that Jesus had with one of his disciples, Peter. And Peter said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brothers who sins against me? And he said, should I forgive up to seven times? And Jesus said, not seven times, but 70 times seven, meaning many, many times. And I also know that, I also learned that in Islam, it is said that he who forgives and is reconciled with his enemy shall receive his reward from God. So you can see that forgiveness, reconciliation are found in many faith. And I learned from Hinduism too, Gandhi who was saying, an eye for eye leaves the whole world blind. Or you could say, Tooth for tooth leaves all of us toothless. So basically, faith becomes a powerful motivation for me to embrace forgiveness and reconciliation. And let's suppose there are people among us who don't believe. Those who don't believe certainly know from common sense that revenge is wrong. They know that two wrongs do not do not make it right. So that was a great motivation, but that was not it. The last motivation that helped me very much was um, about my emotional and my physical health. As I said, after the genocide, I was devastated by anger, by bitterness. I had hard time sleeping, headache, stomachache. It was unbearable. So I realized that all that was because of the anger and the bitterness that I had. Because as you know, anger and bitterness, like any other negative emotion, they release toxic hormones in the body. And those toxic hormones that are in your body, they will trigger a host of diseases, including heart diseases. So we have to be very, very careful. And you must know that when you hold on anger, some people hold on anger thinking, okay, I hold on anger, I hate this guy, he did wrong, but you are not really harming that person. You are harming yourself. And I understood that. It's that saying that says, holding on anger is like drinking poison and wishing your enemy would die. It's not your enemy who is going to die. It's you going to die. So I realized that, and together, these three motivations really stayed with me for the last, more, I mean, almost 20 years, and they have really helped me to be even better than the person I was before the genocide. It's amazing how forgiveness, this act of kindness, can really improve your overall health. So to conclude, let me say this. Let me conclude by saying that uh, my loss in the genocide was a catastrophe beyond beliefs. It was really a catastrophe. I wouldn't have overcome the trauma from that loss without forgiveness. I wouldn't really have been able to show kindness to that genocide suspect in prison without forgiveness. No way, no way. So. If each of us behaved every day and all day with kindness and forgiveness, those small acts, those small acts of forgiveness and kindness would add up and spread and take roots and help as to have a world that is more peaceful and so that we can leave behind, we can leave to our children, our grandchildren, a better world. And so I ask you to start that journey, a journey I had started for the last 20 years. And I believe we all have the power and we have responsibility to do it. And so let us start today. And if I can do it, I'm sure you can do it. Thank you very much, and God bless you.